So being thrown off center um, mm -hmm. means probably something dramatic changed in your life. Mm. Maybe somebody very close died. Maybe um, you are extremely sick. Maybe you give birth. Maybe uh, something apparently really, really bad happens to you. Life throws you off center when we tend to carefully um, to ourselves, to the given, uh, we might realize that it's actually an invitation to uh, come into the center where we previously actually not even have been. <laughs> Action. Welcome to the Spirit of Yoga. We are Kirsten, Dave Daz, and Bukhan from the Akasha Yoga Academy. In today's tea chat, we explore the topic of align and center. Are. So alignment, alignment, being centered. And that is in many ways a central topic in yoga <laughs> <laughs> because yoga is all mm. about balance. The um, famous translation that is given for yoga is union, but it can be related to what is called a yoke. A yoke is what in agricultural societies of archaic times, people are carrying heavy weights. It's like a beam of wood and then you have two heavy buckets of water or whatever it is. So that's a yoke and yoga comes from yoke to bring together those two extremes to balance mm. between polar opposites. That is what yoga is about. So in its nature, in its center, yoga is about centering, about aligning, about finding balance and harmony. So in many ways, we're going into the roots of yoga and we will actually not only discover what centeredness is, but also we approach it from the negative side, misalignment, because usually we are out of balance because we get drawn in this or that direction, life tends to be pretty intense. And if we leave, live in these extremes, we sometimes lose our inner center. And that in many ways can lead to not only imbalance, but even disease. Mm. So all types of psychological unclarity and disharmonious relationships can relate from lack of balance. So we will explore today the pitfalls, the catches, how things can go wrong and south but then how to use yogic techniques, the art of living as we know it on the yogic path to realign and recenter ourselves. So we started with a short popcorn round asking Devdas directly, what does it mean to be aligned and centered? Resting in such a peaceful seat as you are <laughs> day and night living in meditation, share your secret sauce. How do you do it? Your daughter is jumping all over your head and is in your face. Literally. <laughs> Literally. How do you keep that calm, that peacefulness, that serenity in the middle of the storm? Fun. I like when you were introducing the topic, I felt like, um, you know, lack of centeredness eventually kind of culminating in dis-ease. Mm -hmm. I thought, and you know, even that word, dis-ease, it means you're not at ease. Mm -hmm. And one of the profound ways of staying centered in this world, I feel like, is actually just ease. Mm -hmm. Ease means kind of just relaxed in your body, relaxed in your emotions, relaxed in your heart. Um, and, you know, the there's a funny story of... Um, Satchirananda that I feel like Satchirananda was one of the great American yogis, an absolutely unbelievably beautiful human being. And he, um, I knew some people in that ashram in its early years. And one of the men was very sincere, extremely devoted to the, to the practice and to the teaching. He was living at the ashram. And, but he had it in the back of his mind, like there must be like a secret teaching. You know, there must be like Satchitananda probably told us most of the teachings, but there's probably like some secret teaching that he's just like holding back to himself that one day he's just going to tell me the secret teaching and then boom, 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 it's all going to fall into place like dominoes. And um, so he had this in the back of his mind and one day he's sitting in meditation, Satchitananda's there, many, many, many other people were there, the ashram was very popular. And suddenly the people started to slowly leave the room. 
and just saw Chidananda there and only a few people. And he's like, starts to get this intense thing like, today's the day, today's the day. It's, go it's gonna happen. Like he's gonna reveal the secret teaching. I know it's today, I know it. And it's, it's kind of burning up inside of him, getting so strong and a few more people leave. And he's like, oh, for sure this is it. Like this is the moment. He's gonna reveal to me the secrets of the universe right now, right here just getting super excited about it. And finally, the last people leave. It's just Satchitananda in the front and him sitting in his meditation seat. And now he's just bursting at the seams. It's happening today, it's happening today. Satchitananda steps off of his seat, starts to walk toward the man. Oh, like, leans down, whispers in his ear, take it easy. <laughs> I've been trying so hard and now it's a special moment and what's the special technique I need to do? Take, Take it, it easy. And I feel like that's, I don't know, if I could boil down the experience of centeredness in some ways, I would say, take it easy. Mm -hmm. Be at ease. Mm. Mm. Allow for centeredness to arise. Trust in the intelligence of life, the wisdom of existence to naturally gravitate yeah. back towards the center mm. instead of pulling ourselves in all directions. Mm. Interesting. Mm. And small footnote, Satchitananda, definitely super famous. Like he's. Yeah. I think uh, uh, a student of Swami Shivananda yeah. and the founder of Integral, Integral yoga, yoga, one of the Integral yeah. Yoga lineages. Yeah. And uh, famously, um, actually before I was born, but in some ways in my youth, in uh, the Woodstock times, the hippie uh, generation, 1968, 69, 70, uh, Swami Satchitananda was one of the great heroes yeah. of the hippie movement yeah. and was even in Woodstock on yeah. the stage together with Shri Shri Ravi Shankar yeah, playing the yeah. sitar in the early days, bringing the yogic yeah. wisdom to the U.S. counterculture. Yeah. And Shivananda had this thing that all of his renunciates um, would shave their head and their face also. Like they had this kind of austere look, the same sure. as Shivananda. And the story is that Satchitananda had this beautiful, beautiful, even when he was old, he had this huge mane of gray <laughs> hair and this giant <laughs> beard, beard, you know, yeah, just yeah, yeah. incredible. And the story is that Shivananda was going to kind of shave his head and he looked at Satchitananda and he was like, no, it's just too beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your life in I can't do it. And if that's just... you're already there. So I, I sometimes also try to convince way. you I'm of shaving, way. but <laughs> cannot, cannot tame the lion. <laughs> So Kirsten, how do you stay centered in the storms of your daily life when things go wild and Serena, your daughter, is getting into a tantrum and is trying to throw you out of alignment? How do you keep your calm? How do you stay at ease in these at times challenging periods? Yeah, we were speaking about the topic being align and center and... I feel alignment leads to centeredness, like to align. What comes to my mind when I think about alignment, uh, it's a certain authenticity, I would mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Alignment is when thought, speech and action become one flow, when um, alignment is what's needed is coming your way um, without you know, pulling and pushing and like being in this uh, dynamic, but kind of it's revealing rather than you're looking for and searching has also to do with ease. And I feel this alignment invites for centeredness or creates centeredness. So I feel um, a certain authenticity is what creates mm -hmm. centeredness and um, when I think about alignment, what um, what can be done uh, to find alignment is um, to meet life with honesty in a way and openness. Um, openness in a way that availability. Mm -hmm. 
availability to understand what's happening in life, like to understand the bigger picture, uh, not mentally, rationally in order to do something with that, but more like in an experiential way to understand flows and um, internal flows, external flows, and uh, to go with those flows, to go with rhythms, um, this natural rhythm of going out, going in, uh, natural rhythms of rest, repose, and strength, and activity. Um, like when I start aligning, basically, mm -hmm. centeredness is the result of it mm. in a way. So basically, you are asking, what do I do when <laughs> Serena um, is going wild? Like, how can I stay centered? Um, the centeredness is there when I'm in alignment. Like, I cannot do centeredness. Like, mm. it's there or not, kind mm. of. Um, and it's there mm. or not uh, to an extent how much I'm in alignment or how much I'm responding to the given and are able to, you know, put pieces together. Um, and when I allow for that, centeredness is there naturally and Serena can go wild and uh, there's nothing to be done like centeredness just is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is what's coming, like how this topic somehow come yeah. together that's also that's also a really beautiful recognition in the in the fact that i feel like you know, some people have this idea spiritually it's like okay i'm going to get on the spiritual path and then it's just going to be like roses are falling from heaven and i'm just walking oh, lotus down flowers this, mostly uh, yeah lotus <laughs> roses everything falling from heaven and i'm just going to be living this life where there's no such thing as kind of disharmony in my field mm -hmm. and that was just like a very interesting thing um being in my own teacher's presence in India is that what I saw is that there was actually times where there was a lot of disharmony happening in his field, but he himself was absolutely unshakably centered. And it was just like, okay, so, you know, someone could be totally freaking out and making a big fuss and having something happen. And when you looked at him, it was just like, absolutely rock solid like just standing in his heart and with whatever's happening and i feel like that's very beautifully present in your in your story and in that way i feel like it's a it's a kind of like it's a very different paradigm than a kind of materialist paradigm which is like what is the outcome of this situation ah then it wasn't like in alignment mm -hmm. it's not about that right it's not about whether or not it goes favorably or whether or not it goes unfavorably it's that more a feeling like if it goes unfair unfavorably where am i in that like am i centered in my heart am i am i still connected profoundly to the to the presence and the moment of of this lifetime and just understanding this is a passing phenomenon that's happening inside of this lifetime mm -hmm. and it, you know it's gonna it's gonna pass and if there's a job for me it's just to be here and be present with it as it unfolds not looking to kind of, oh, what's the outcome? How is this going to go? Ah, blah, blah, blah. But rather just sitting back and, um, you know, keeping that sense of centeredness, even when the situation seems extremely dis disharmonious. Mm -hmm. right? So staying centered in many ways in the present moment with that attitude of observing, witnessing, mm -hmm. stepping back to be grounded, rooted in that serenity, to be at ease despite of the intensity, to be centered, solid like a rock in the eye of the storm while the world is unfolding in its wild intensity and extremes of the whirlwind as the meteorological phenomenon literally is in a hurricane or typhoon in the eye of the storm, there's barely any movement. It's just the right. axis spinning around itself. There's right. the wind speeds in the center of the hurricane are very low as compared to the circumference yeah. where the intensity is raging. Mm -hmm. So realigning ourselves by 
returning to the center, mm. by reconnecting to the source, which is that present moment awareness, not taking it personal, just being a witnessing observer to the energetic movements of mm. life, like kids jumping on your shoulders or whatever else it might be going wrong, uh, economical situation, crashing, losing job, etc. Um, other problems with physical health, physical body falling apart. Okay, observing it as it is, accepting in many ways. Okay, now realigning what can be done, mm. what makes sense to do. That maturity to, it's a famous saying uh, in the Serenity Prayer by Niebuhr, give me the strength to change the things I can change, the, it, something, the, the uh, detachment to accept the things I cannot change, the serenity, and the wisdom to differentiate between the two. Mm. So if there's something to be done, I take action, mm. but in many cases, actually, I cannot change it, and all my activism, my desperate trying hard to kind of with effort bring things back to the center is usually futile efforts, mm. and we try too hard in the wrong areas. Mm. So frequently acceptance is the name of the game, uh, of just observing and being at ease despite of the challenges. Is it really necessary to change anything about the situation? <coughs> So having that maturity, that wisdom, that ability to um, see clearly whatever is appropriate gets done. And in this way we stay in our center, even though we might be acting outward, we might be active, mm. but not in this desperate, trying hard, mm. reaching something, achieving, as you had with the example of that student of Satchitananda, mm. who was like, over ambitious, mm. no? this efforting, trying too hard. And that's frequently also what we see in the asana practice in yoga yeah. studios, yeah. where it's some idealized, perfect acrobatic expression of a pose, and then trying hard to put my body into this or that alignment. Yeah. But I'm getting thrown out of my center because it's mm. too much for my current abilities. Mm. And then I'm trying too hard, I'm efforting, yeah. I'm overstretching and possibly injuring myself. Mm. And then I'm definitely thrown out of alignment, out of that centeredness. Yeah. So maybe you can speak a bit on the topic of acceptance to stay centered in any moment in life, but in any pose of life or on the yoga mat. And then in a way we we kind of gradually can stretch our limits, mm. but we don't push the envelope too much, otherwise it will break. Yeah. So in some ways there is of course something to um, challenge ourselves in uh, a demanding pose. And then the key is you know, maybe my body is kind of going towards maximum what it allows for, but still in my mind, in my attitude, I stay centered. It's not that I'm also over stretching, over efforting in my mind with this desperate, over ambitious, trying too hard. And then this pushiness can lead to injuries. Mm. So maybe you can speak a bit about how to stay centered in challenging poses on the mat. I find it's a good point to start with to see uh, what's the given. Mm. Like to see what am I here with and Am mm. I equipped to do mm. 30 minutes of headstands or am I equipped for um, splits or not? So first check in with the given and kind of have a thorough understanding of with what we are here and then to see if that fits actually to your ideas. And that's exactly what you said before is this honesty taking a sincere look at ourselves, sober seeing to evaluate sincerely what is my body about. Maybe some old injuries, 
um, some habitual tendencies of misalignment, contract, contraction, constriction, shortness due to lifestyle, etc. So taking an honest look. And then I feel next, like, what's my approach, my attitude, like, uh, what's the intention? Um, why is it important to me to do 30 minutes of headstands? Like, <laughs> that I just take that because that was uh, once I was training for and gave up like at 20, 25 minutes because I understood that's completely silly. Still pretty um, good. <laughs> Still pretty good. 25 minutes in headstands. But it is, uh, it was completely silly exactly. because I was not equipped for that. Um, mm. Like uh, mm. the strength wasn't there to properly support uh, mm. the supportive structure in the body. And it was a silly attempt. Um, but I had this to, idea. Yeah, can I had trouble this, in your neck, whatever injuries, shoulder, this, that. I had this idea that uh, that would be uh, something to strive for. Like a real yogi should be standing on uh, her hat for a while. And um, what was the idea? Um, approaching yoga from the outside, thinking of uh, or having the idea achievement of a posture would lead to any result. Of course, I chose headstand because I learned that's the most powerful posture the that's activating your Sarasvara chakra Ram and chakra. that's creating the strongest sublimation. So like that for sure must lead to bliss um, and to uh, revelation. Um, yeah, that was just also a silly idea um, that a posture can reveal something. Of course, on the way to practicing the posture you know there's this saying what i really yeah i know thought. what you're gonna say uh yoga is not about reaching your toes but what you learn on the way down kind of i wanted to say it differently uh there's this saying i think i uh, kind of um, got it from the ashtanga world uh the injury is your teacher injury is your mm. teacher and i found that extremely silly like how can you have such a silly statement but actually the injury is a teacher in checking in with what am i here actually what's my motivation what's my goal it's a tough teacher but for sure um not for sure but hopefully once you injured yourself you got a point kind of of what the structure is about about achievement about goal orientation about putting value into shape um, so basically that was an understanding um, I luckily didn't injure myself seriously or long term I just felt like my neck and skull don't want to go to 30 minutes headstand when I cannot properly support that with shoulder and um, arm strength. So you can just put yourself on your head and uh, stand there for a while, but like it's not great um, for the supportive structures. So I learned that it's not a posture that leads to, to liberation. <laughs> the headstand itself doesn't give liberation. Like um, it is an inner transformation that needs to take place. It is a change of perspective. It is a, a different approaching life from a different realm. Uh, it's not working with the posture only. So that was my own example. Um, but um, Generally, like, yes, uh, if you are up for doing like, hey, you know, I want a nail split because split uh, seems to be something really, really good. You should be working on your hips. The hips store so many emotions and I should be freeing myself. And when I do splits, I'm for sure like a transformed person. Um, if you want to do that, check first if your hips are actually made for doing that. Or a lotus pose, another famous one, like so many people would really mm. like to sit in lotus pose Full and lotus think Padmasana. that then meditation will for sure mm. flow better. Um, but before that, just first check, like, is that really happening in your body in this lifetime? So I feel a uh, thorough evaluation <laughs> of the given mm -hmm. is, uh, mm -hmm. is a good starting point. For 
asana for anything you do basically in life um just check mm. where you are mm. Mm. reminds me <clears throat> of the saying of one of our meditation teachers that it's more likely that you can find a state of samadhi of this cosmic consciousness and expansion on a chair as compared to when you try too hard on the floor and you're mm. kind of either sitting like in a crunched position like this yeah but i have to sit on the floor i can only go deep or cross legged uh, or you're forcing your body into a full lotus pose and mm. trying to find liberation in that way is somewhat unlikely exactly so preconceived ideas that's in a way related to what you say and an honest look this sincere seeing a self evaluation without being judgmental just a um clear sober look um can be so much more valuable than following in a way our belief systems our conditioning some seeds which were planted like you gave the headstand uh case the king of asana activating the crown chakra half an hour one hour and then and then it's also a goal orientation a striving which in many ways can pull us out of the center that we try to get somewhere and in many ways the spiritual path has been described rather as a coming back home as a returning to the center um and that uh, we can talk later about also uh the heart returning to heart center um being aligned in that um dynamic equilibrium within so we'll come back to that one later on the spiritual side but maybe we um look at some other aspects about the physical alignment mm. and centeredness in the body if that's can you share some of your experiments where maybe you got too ambitious mm -hmm. and pulled yourself out of center by exaggerating in this or that way how did you encounter misalignment in mm. your yogic path specifically in the context of asana where the poses were kind of too much for your body mm. well i i love what you said about injury being the teacher and i feel like in my own practice if i had a kind of similar phrase it would actually be let the breath be your teacher because i feel like that can stop you from so many exaggerated pronouncements because your breath just knows what your mind can't know in a weird way it's like you're you're too far in a pose if you're really listening to your breath really listening to the subtlety of it something changes in the breath you back off a little bit um i remember once on our 200 hour course we were having a zoom call with somebody and she was telling me she's a a shtangi and i said okay no worries that's a very physical form of yoga very sure. challenging form of yoga and i said okay that sounds great but i have one question for you and i want you to answer it absolutely honestly do you ever switch from breathing between your nose to your mouth and she said oh all the time <laughs> it was kind of like okay that's that's what what you're talking about that's the striving element it's like i should push myself to the point where i can do this pose it's like okay but how about rather than that listening to the cue of your breath to say hey wait a minute maybe that's enough for today and maybe tomorrow that changes like every single time we come to the mat we have to come absolutely fresh just mm -hmm. like what's possible i don't know like we're going to we're going to play around and we're going to find out what's possible but in that play of possibility i'm really listening profoundly to to the inner movement of my energy to see hey is this pose right for me is this pose not right for me today and i don't make any assumptions about what's coming next it's just like maybe mountain pose the simplest pose something in my breath changes that's enough of a sign that i should back out regardless of how unchallenging that pose may seem or how challenging a pose may seem if i'm really profoundly listening i back off from you know from from that based on factual information that's being sent to me through my nervous system right it's but you know i feel this is where the problem kind of starts it is many of us we come from a massive disconnection basically yeah. mm -hmm. like from a lifestyle that is um coming from 
scheduled life from to-do lists and the to-do list and the scheduled life is not necessarily asking if this is right for you in the moment mm -hmm. and we're kind of um, used mm -hmm. to just you know deliver function, and yeah. function deliver and uh, live the world according to outer rules and expectations um, maybe self expectations and and mm -hmm. rules from the mind and mm -hmm. if you're coming with this disconnect to the yoga mat um, of course we hear that in every yoga class like really listen to your body and do what's right for you but like what do i know from what's right for me if i never listen to myself like mm -hmm. um, i feel and when i come like that to the yoga mat um, and start practicing and pulling and pushing my body and mm. see like that looks somehow good like I try that mm. too mm. when I basically approach yoga with the same way kind of with the outer shape idea because that's where we start from like I started from outer shape too um, it took me many years to really understand uh, to approach yoga from the inside mm. and that is like even asana is an inner process not an outer process it's, it has an outer expression but it's an inner process but it's a learning and not everybody that comes walking into a yoga studio on the street um, has this capacity I think everybody has this capacity but maybe it's not activated mm. and um, of course, this is where injury, where striving, where all that comes from. Mm. So first we have to learn kind of to stop, listen, to turn in, to understand like there's a whole inner world um, exactly. next to the outer world. And this needs to be first read, then understood, then acknowledged and listened to. And then I can do my yoga. Mm. Um, so I feel... This is kind of where, like if you say, yeah, listen to the subtle changes in your breath. Probably most people don't even realize if they breathe through the mo mouth or nose, like, um, mm. because there's, mm. yeah. like, just thinking of yeah. teaching in and, like, walk in, uh, teaching walk in yoga classes, like, uh, what's seen there, how people put themselves into poses. Mm. It's like, whoa, that's not coming from yeah. connection. Yeah. Yeah, but the point would be that the breath gives a more accessible feedback yeah. Yeah. than the mindset. Because, Definitely. you know, yeah. to acknowledge my mindset, if it's pushy or not, it's just what I'm used to. It's my status quo, my normal gear. I that don't I'm even on realize. The achieving yeah. mode, etc. But the breath is a more direct, obvious feedback right. mechanism. Yeah. I sometimes call it a barometer where you get a reading uh, and you see if the pressure is high or low. Um, <laughs> and it's actually even the, um, the founder, initiator of uh, the Ashtanga Vinyasa style, Patabi Joyce, who was uh, literally speaking on that topic to have the quality of the breath uh, the same or at least similar in all poses. Yes. Can you keep the same relaxed breath as you have it in a plain standing pose of yeah. mountain pose or whatever it might be, simple, non-challenging posture mm. where it's comparatively easy to have a soft, smooth, long, relaxed breath. But can you sustain that breath also in a demanding arm balance? Mm. And if not, you're not ready for it. You're yeah. trying too hard, you're pushing, you're bound to injure yourself. And then, as you said, Kirsten, then uh, the injury will be your best teacher. Uh, because it's a feedback mechanism. You didn't listen to your breath, but now you listen to your body because you tried too hard, you overchallenged yourself. And in some ways, I would dare to assume that the Ashtanga Vinyasa style is among those three, five styles of yoga which have the highest injury rates because it has this tendency of going strong and has a certain ambitious vibe to it, which is even within the Ashtanga community acknowledged. Mm. Even though but, but Patabi Joyce was speaking in the other direction and warning in yeah. a way of that. And also, I, I, someone told me, I never verified this, but someone told me actually in the very old school style of, of um, Ashtanga in Mysore, 
if you couldn't breathe evenly through a posture, yeah. you you could not proceed to yes. the next posture. Yes. It was just like yes. you're out of the game. Like yeah. your your sequence ends there. Exactly. You don't even, you don't even get the next posture. Exactly. So it's like Come okay, back tomorrow, it's go really to that putting posture. the breath strongly first like yes. to say okay i mean i feel like in a weird way that's stronger than we would put the breath in a modern practice if no, i was practicing with a group of people and i saw someone struggling with their breath i wouldn't say don't go to the next pose i would say <laughs> take child's pose <laughs> take shavasana lie down take a couple deep breaths like reconnect to your breath fully come back into the practice again yeah. if it happens again lie down again you know like kind of follow the rhythm of your of your breath rather than step completely out mm -hmm. of the practice but that means that they had a very strong kind of sense of the breath yeah. is the center of the practice mm -hmm. and you 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 make that the kind of like indication of what you can and can't do exactly so the emphasis on the ujjayi breath the ocean breath the victorious breath is super strong actually in the mysore style yeah. of ashtanga vinyasa but then in the modern studio mm. world and yoga industry, vinyasa yeah. style became the dominant way of practicing. Yeah. And yes, here and there the breath is mentioned, but mm. with by far less emphasis uh, yeah. as it is in the Definitely. roots of Definitely. both uh, um, Patabi Joy's Ashtanga Vinyasa, Mysore style practice, yeah. but also in the roots of that practice in Krishnamacharya, the teacher of Patabi Joy's and the teacher of BKS Iyengar. Yeah. Krishnamacharya had such a strong emphasis on the breath awareness yeah. and this ujjayi ocean yeah. breath. And that's been kind of an amazing thing about being on Zoom calls with students from all over the world on our courses. It's like I have students, I, I get reports from all over the world of different students and what their condition is in their local yoga studios. One student from Amsterdam says, OK, there's six major studios in Amsterdam. I've taken classes at all six of those studios. I've never even once heard the word ujjayi what's ujjayi it's breath? just like i almost fell off my chair <laughs> i was just like wait a minute are you serious but he was absolutely legitimate like he'd been to all the major studios he'd practiced all the styles then he finally discovers ujjayi and it's like, unlocks something tremendously in his practice he's like i've never practiced like this before i've never felt like this before i've never felt the power of yoga like this before why because you're picking it up by the string that makes it line align. It's like we're talking about centeredness. How does centeredness come in the practice? It aligns through the element of the breath. Just to clarify that ujjayi breath, usually called ocean breath, literally translates as victorious breath and is about creating that subtle, gentle sound in the throat area, which gives us a feedback mechanism to observe each and every breath and being able to lengthen and deepen the breath Com combining in a way our breath awareness with the physical body process and having that continuous alignment and ongoing awareness of the breath which is such a key as we described as a feedback mechanism to see how much we're possibly trying too hard yeah so the breath as a key for staying centered as mentioned to stay centered in the present moment with each and every breath mm. and to observe the quality to have an honest sincere look at where am i at in my body in this pose in my life and then re-evaluate whatever is appropriate for me in this moment how much should i go in that direction does it help me to center myself or am i actually living in delusion and uh I assume that it's good for me, but I'm uh, in fact pulling myself more out of center. Mm -hmm. So that could be also a classical modern context where we live a more or less high performance life of achievement, goal reaching, a lot of expectations externally or internally, as you mentioned, uh, being more or less ambitious, trying hard to reach our goals, etc. And we're more or less rushed in our hyperactive surroundings, uh, being very busy, engaged, over-engaged. And then, okay, we want to do something good for ourselves. Let's do some yoga. And then we have a tendency coming from that habitual activism and from the conditioning of achievement that we would also resonate with a style of yoga which is a rather dynamic, strong, powerful style 
which um, in a way is great to cultivate these attitudes of you know, being in this you know, strong expression of the body and uh, improving and developing more flexibility, more strength and so on, which in some ways for the physical body can be having many benefits, no doubt, but for our entire being, where we're already somewhat out of center towards the hyperactive style uh, of lifestyle, then we also choose a very dynamic, demanding asana yoga style, yeah. and then we get even more out of center. Mm -hmm. Like our lifestyle is hyperactive, mm -hmm. and our dynamic and demanding yoga practice is amplifying that tendency even more. And then I wonder why this yoga makes me kind of even more tired and even more depleted or yeah. aggravated, etc. Yoga is supposed to help me to relax and soften my attitude, be at ease, as you were suggesting. Mm -hmm. And then it might be just, um, anyway, due to my resonance, my tendencies, I choose, in quotation marks, the wrong, better said, the inappropriate style of yoga. I would be better off counterbalancing my tendency of hyperactivity with a very soft and gentle restorative style of yoga mm. where I can counterbalance my daily life habits and circumstances with something really calming and relaxing to soften and in this way counterbalance and find the harmony mm. in my life. So mm. maybe you can speak a bit to that, to the different types of practices which might be also matching the season of the year or my life where am i at in this moment am i just coming out of childbirth uh, breastfeeding and i need a lot of nourishing nurturing recharging or am i coming out of winter and it's springtime and i want to activate more maybe now the dynamic style is more appropriate is my personality rather uh, heavy characterized by inertia laziness Oh, okay, then it might be good for me to go in the active dynamic styles in this season of the year of my life. Mm. So maybe you can speak a bit how to find what is appropriate for me. As you mentioned, it starts with a honest self-observation, clear seeing, sober, sincere re-evaluation re of where I'm at, what would be appropriate, but more practical, hands-on. How can people make the right move or maybe don't move and just meditate. I feel like generally Hatha Yoga is a good start, kind of Hatha in itself aims for creating balance um, and that's the root of all the different expressions that are out there. But of course my Hatha Yoga practice can be um, more vigorous or it can be more chilled out. Um, so I feel it's important to see a little bit also not only the given in the body but also the given in tendencies uh, the energetic given and then of course act um, accordingly meaning like to find um, how do I balance what I feel is aggravated or too much in my being so if I have a high stress job um, and I'm chasing one meeting after another and I'm overwhelmed by my big uh, to-do list and basically uh, have on top of that a family at home and I'm just running, running, running all day long. Don't keep on running in the yoga practice. Mm -hmm. uh, probably your yoga practice uh, might be more of a restorative yoga practice, especially if you're... Uh, stressed out lifestyle makes you feel like hey I'm running towards burnout hey I feel depleted that's depleting me um, an answer that often come, times comes then like more coffee and more action and try to just push through but like that will run you into your burnout um, and a uh, more wise answer is to seek uh, restorative yoga nidra yoga of course, this is not doing the job of taking care of your abs and uh, shoulders, but it's taking care of uh, your health in the long run.
nervous system, otherwise running also into danger of psychosomatic diseases, that the stress in my mind will also reflect absolutely, in problems absolutely. in the body. So um, if this is my situation, I would use the yoga that what I can provide and give to you in your situation and balance that. Like if you need nourishment um, because you feel already going towards depleted, don't look for sources that kind of push and spike your energy even more because uh, there is an end to it. Um, it will be finished at one point. Yeah, but it's difficult um, because my tendency from my character, from my typology, my conditioning, that's exactly what I like, what I enjoy, what I indulge in almost, what I, what I thrive in and what I'm... Like, you know, it's my way of being. And that's mm. why I live my life every day like this. Sure, mm. supercharged by society, expectations, etc. But then I have a strong tendency to continue on that thread. And I even get positive reaffirmation because of my tendencies, character and earlier training, etc. I'm good at that also yoga style. I'm excelling. I get positive feedback in social media. And then I push myself even more and I don't even notice that I'm out of balance. So there might be also a benefit in some outer reflection, some third party, which could be a wise peer, a mature friend or a teacher, or, um, a teacher which has the clarity and wisdom mm -hmm. and sincerity to also um, no, call me out uh, and confront me with that mm. for example no? i injure myself then i complain to my teacher like oh yeah da, 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 and basically almost blame the teacher kind of like oh your yoga class your yoga style injured me but it's not that yoga injures us but it's our attitude with which we approach yoga mm. that we hurt ourselves and that we maybe didn't listen or we overheard muted the teacher's comment of listen to your body like yeah, I'm listening to my body. I'm getting even more flexible, even more flexible. And it kind of feels good, but I don't see it coming that my hypermobile joints might be prone, uh, making me more prone to injuries. Um, for example, I talked just a few weeks ago on Astrid's birthday, actually. There was a, a wonderful old lady uh, with us at the birthday dinner. She was like in her mid late 70s and she was one of the foremost Ashtanga yoga teachers of the 1980s, oh, wow. 1990s. Wow. Like amazing. I was like, whoa, like you're such a hero and you were with Patabi Joyce in the 1980s. And then you know, she was, was telling stories how she was teaching in Goa, in India, famous for decades there and so on. And how her whole identity revolved around that Ashtanga yogini, super flexible, super mm. strong and so on. And then she was telling how sometime in her 60s or so, she simply said, and then my hip popped. And from then on, I couldn't do the practice anymore. And it reset and questions my whole identity, who I was, because wow. I couldn't be that strong, flexible Ashtanga Yogini anymore. And my whole teaching career and this and that, it undermined, it questions, it pulled the carpet under my feet. Um, and then I, she just told it very briefly as an anecdote. And then I was carefully, with all due respect, checking in with her um, because she just said, and then my hip popped and I was kind of not clear what really happened. And then I carefully asked her, do you think that popping of your hip was related to the hypermobility which you cultivated over years and decades in your Ashtanga practice and that too much flexibility in your hip. And she was like, yes, of course, undoubtedly, that was the reason. Mm. So it was very clear in her life journey over decades wow. on the mat that that imbalance, that mm. being pulled out of center and exaggeration mm. uh, in the physical practice led to massive trouble. And she mm. was not limping away, but one could see that she was still bothered from that hip wow. injury. Wow. So um, frequently, like you said, also with your headstand story, well, it can take us years to come to that insight. The teacher of the injury can be like in some ways obvious. Yes, as you were just uh, describing a person who is like, but this is what I like. This is what I'm good at. 
Uh, my question came, for how long? Exactly. Mm. Is that sustainable? Mm. Exactly. So maybe we can shift gears on that and see, okay, centeredness in what's appropriate for my body, but centeredness more general, being aligned across the different areas of life. So that would be in my individual being the physical body, having symmetry there, noticing possible scoliosis and stronger right arm and imbalances, finding symmetry in my physical body, finding energetic balance, the prana, life force, chi being harmoniously aligned, my emotions being stable, solid, grounded, rooted, not getting lost in over-dramatizing tantrums, the emotional storms and whirlwinds of our feelings and emotional charges, being balanced and centered in my mind, aligned with my intellectual clarity, the vision, different goals, areas in my life, do they match, is there alignment, my spiritual alignment, am I on different spiritual paths at the same time, some teacher lineage tells me something, another lineage tells me something opposing, then I'm kind of torn apart, what should I do, my career uh, imposes upon me these goals, my family life expects that from me, then I'm out of center, I neglect certain areas in my life, mm. my body suffers from that. So generally alignment as a holistic well-being, which in many ways seems impossible with all the demanding necessities of daily life, mm. all the things we have to do, mm. how can we stay centered and aligned across the different areas and cultivate this yogic union? that harmonious balance, that dynamic equilibrium, which is not fixed, stable, locked, static, but is a dynamic adjusting, readjusting, mm. constant counterbalancing, recentering, realigning, even though life in the surroundings and in my own tendencies constantly pulls me in this or that way out of mm. balance. Mm. Any examples from your own life experience, um, anecdotes where this gets more tangible? How did you get thrown off balance and took you a while to kind of brush it off, shake it up and come back to center? What helped you? Any practical advice, how to cope with these extremes of daily life? Uh, many question marks <laughs> arise when you uh, ask me like that. First of all, do I need symmetry in order to be centered? Uh, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe a big storm of life pulls me here and there. I don't think life pulls us around. It's more like we are pulling and pushing mm, life itself is in total harmony uh -huh. mm. um mm. and uh, what wow. comes to me when i hear that is where we started um acknowledge the given mm -hmm. mm. observing witnessing be with the given and like any seeming strong push of life out of center is more like a call of life to understand your uncenteredness mm -hmm. and an invitation to actually come into centeredness mm. and yeah i'm just thinking of um, giving birth i felt that uh, was for me a very strong throwing off center in a way but like in in a way, it was like throwing me into my center. Mm -hmm. uh, but seemingly at the beginning, when like I give birth naturally, I'm very old or was very old. Uh, the body was very old for giving birth and it was home birth. And home the, birth on the rice fields. On the rice fields, the baby was delayed two weeks and um, like all not the most favorable conditions to give birth. But it was really important uh, to us. Uh, to give birth naturally and 
after such a process, um, the body that was reliable until the day of giving birth as like an unshakable physical reality was just like not reliable anymore. Like after giving birth, the body is just like not what it was before. Uh, you are with something that you don't know and doesn't re it's like non you have to non-functional non-functional energetically giving birth i realized is really blowing out your muladhara chakra in a way like Blue your center vitality. of vitality mm -hmm. like uh, it's just poof, fully depleted like in the biggest way possible um and this was kind of where a lot of centeredness, where I drew a lot of centeredness from uh, before giving birth, like in this more uh, physical um, realms or vibrations of being where my definition and where my home of centeredness was from. Um, so it shook me completely out of mm -hmm. that, but actually into the center, into the center of my heart, basically a completely different vibration, uh, home uh, was mm. arising out of that. Um, but uh, what did I do? I, because of course also being with Devdas who was holding my hand always, um, just tending to the given, okay, the body is now completely you cannot walk to the toilet by yourself because probably you just faint and fall like that's all like you cannot walk like five steps on your own um just be with that let others feed you let others tend to you um slowly you know coming back into strength just step by step take it easy um you know do the right practice that's right that's giving nourishment do the right practice that brings back structure eat the right do the right take the time to heal and just like tend to what's there like uh, six weeks after childbirth you are not your old self you will never be your old self uh, but um, just to really acknowledge that that it was that there is that something profoundly shifted change so being thrown off center mm -hmm. um, means probably something dramatic changed in your life mm. maybe somebody very close died maybe um, you are extremely sick maybe you give birth maybe uh, something apparently really really bad happens to you you lose your extremely important job your house your whatnot like something life throws you off center but um, when we attend, when we tend to carefully um, to ourselves, to the given, uh, we might realize that it's actually an invitation to uh, come into the center where we previously actually not even have been. Like we, because of the change, it feels like we are thrown off center, but just the change, like the that what was before change not necessarily was centeredness or center, but like this uh, shaken up can be actually a great uh, invitation to come back into center. That would be centeredness also across the lifespan, seasons in our life and different areas in our life where it can be for a few weeks, months, years, or even decades, the season of this or that. And in some ways that might be temporarily, seemingly off center and later on in another stage in life gets counterbalanced by something else. So also being aligned with what's alive and appropriate in this season. So whatever, obviously after childbirth, it's not the time directly for Saturday night fever. Uh, so obvious, uh, obvious things, but frequently we are um, kind of ignoring those signs, those uh, 
calls to action or calls to inaction um, that we push ourselves, force ourselves, expectations from outside which we internalize and then not listening to the rhythm what is appropriate in this moment and that then really causes trouble and this is when then this ease comes we get stressed mm. out we push too much try too hard and then out of that this ease can come also disease yeah. because we're not listening to the uh, invitations as you described also before we lose our intuition because we mm. lack the sensitivity receptivity we're disconnected um, in this somehow modern technological life which throws us out of our original connection to the natural rhythms circadian rhythm of going to bed and rising with the sun uh, and alignment of the natural cycles the seasons etc so because we're in many ways living a life misaligned to natural rhythms we also lose our intuition we numb ourselves mm. uh, that causes then lack of sensitivity receptivity yeah. then we lose connection to our bodies reduced intuition the intuitive mm. alignment mm. Uh, is not there anymore whatever chemical influences uh, food industry etc um, throwing us out of our natural alignment and then it can be of course very challenging to yeah. return to that natural alignment good so maybe a few last practical tips and tricks recommendations we talked about the breath in asanas yeah. as a barometer as a feedback mechanism to return to centeredness listening to the inner call that honesty sincerity to tune in again with our uh, intuition other practical tips and tricks how to realign to return to center how to sense what is appropriate for me in this moment it's a it's a beautiful question i feel like just the question what's trying to happen can be a really beautiful way of just what we were talking about about the honesty and coming back into the center point but i would also say one of the reasons why i feel like yoga is so successful in the modern world is in general we tend to think of things as in a kind of a mechanistic way it's like okay my 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 body's not in a very good shape i should work out with my body and put it in a better shape and that's actually not the yogic philosophy on what's happening in your body. The yogic philosophy would be pick up by the breath, which is a more subtle manifestation of the life force in your body, and let that correct what's happening in your body. Now you might think that's not a very effective way of, of dealing with the problem. In fact, it is the most mm -hmm. profoundly effective way of dealing with your body <coughs> because yoga is only designed for that. It's designed for wellness of your body, your nervous system, your mind, your subtle body, your energetic body, your every single, your spirit itself. Every single aspect of who you are as a being is covered to some degree, especially when you look at the full spectrum of meditation as being the eight limbs, like where meditation is a part of it and everything is a part of that complete whole. And then in terms of the yogic thinking about that, work with the most subtle body that you have access to mm -hmm. and that can be okay i'm kind of struggling in my physical body okay but i can be aware of my breath i can take these long deep breaths and that can bring back the energetic system when the energetic system is online the physical body many times just falls into shape all by itself because the energy system is online i was recently reading they have now have medical statistics that in western countries the average person uses 10% of the range of their diaphragm in a day. 10%. It's like, well, what does that mean? It basically means that your energetic system is offline. It's like if the energetic system is controlled by the breath and you're using 10% of that capacity, no wonder we sell so much coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Need to counterbalance the lack of like, pranic life force we with know caffeine. That we should have more energy. Uh. It's like, so I, uh, at least I'll take it in a cup. It's like, well, there are much more effective ways of, of receiving energy than from that cup. 
but we're not always taking the time and the awareness. And I would even say that goes like true across every single body. It's like if you want to go to the most subtle body, the bliss body, like if the bliss body's in line, also the energetic body will be in line. Also the physical body will be in line. It's like, what's the most subtle plane of my consciousness that I can access right now? Like, and let me work from there. And, you know, maybe like you guys were sharing, maybe there's really strong disease. The body's not well, but the breath is still there. Like I can start to work with something, um, I, you know, and that will eventually nourish me and bring me into the state of ease. And maybe I start, if I'm really in dis-ease, maybe that's a process. Maybe it takes mm. time. Maybe it takes time to kind of develop my awareness of these more subtle levels of, that are working inside of me. But is the bliss body something that, you know, life is uh, somehow preventing you from accessing? Not in any way. Mm. It's like, it's your birthright that you experience that. It's meant to be that you experience that. Mm. So, but it cannot be faked. Mm. So you have to just work with which, which level can I actually access right now? Mm. And then go more and more and more and more into the realms of subtlety. And inside of the subtlety is the power, actually. So starting where we're at, again, with the sober seeing, and then whatever is appropriate, starting with those basic practices, but also not just getting stuck forever with the basic uh, practices. As you mentioned, there might be even a, like asymmetry in the body, physical mm. alignment not perfect, still the energy can flow exactly. and still there can be emotional balance mm. and even states of spiritual bliss even yeah. though there's not perfect symmetry in my body so not yeah. getting too obsessed with the physical alignment mm. i remember when uh, i did the first 500 hour yoga teacher training i was completely obsessed with the alignment details and was kind of okay then the energy flows if you relax your limbs a bit more and then okay in this pose should i spread the fingers or have the fingers close connected and then I was taking notes of everything and back foot at a 45 degree angle or 60 degree angle. What is correct coming with this German academic blockheadedness of mm. you know, hyper mm. alignment obsession around the physical body. Mm. Um, and then just being at ease also yeah. with these things, relaxing yeah. into it, softening mm. the attitude, allowing life to flow through us mm. instead of trying to manipulate everything. Because frequently we come also with a too mechanistic attitude, not yeah. just on the physical body alignment, but also even with the chakras. When people mm. in the modern times are exploring these energetic centers, it can be you know, like, ah, I have an imbalance on my second chakra. And then they look deeper like, yeah, I think it's on the third spoke of that chakra, this <laughs> third petal. It corresponds uh, to this and that psychological aspect. What practice can I do? What screw do I need to tighten? <laughs> give me this crystal, give me that aromatherapy so I can rebalance the mm. third spoke of my third chakra. And then it's kind of like, whoa, I got thrown out of balance because something else went wrong. And mm. I'm constantly mm. just trying to fix this system in a mechanical way, never re going anywhere. It's kind of three steps forward, two steps backward yeah. and worse. So. Yeah. Um, trusting in the process is in many ways, I feel, one of the best recommendations. Mm. Ease, um, where we ease come from. Ease, that, that. just checking in how much ease is there. Mm. Exactly. So that's a good reminder for myself. I tend to try too hard. I go very strong. Um, I like the extremes. Uh, so counterbalancing, softening, releasing, allowing and in a way, allowing also more of that receptivity, mm. that trust that life will provide. And in a way, on the deepest level, a surrender to life as it is and not taking ourselves so seriously. So I hope you had some yeah. insights, some eye-opening moments, and we trust that we'll go deeper in future episodes to explore other areas, to increase our vitality. Recently, we had a podcast on ice bathing that can definitely help to cool you down when you're overheated in your nervous <laughs> system. And there's a lot of biohacking and yogic mm. technology, which we are sharing here. Mm. And we trust uh, that we'll go deeper and find our center together. 
This was Wisdom in Motion with the Akasha family. Keep shining in the spirit of yoga. Om. Thank you.